Great morning, it's Pastor Paul L. Anderson here at the Fountain of Raleigh Fellowship where we believe God's blessings never stop flowing. God is an awesome God. We thank him how he has displayed all of his creation. And I don't know about you, but I so enjoy getting a chance to see the eclipse on this past Monday. And we can't help but pray for our brothers and sisters who have had so many calamities by way of earthquakes and the other tragedies that have taken place. But it is just so amazing how God's mighty hand has been displayed in the firmament in the heavens above. We saw something with our very own eyes. Many of you wore those glasses. I didn't wear the glasses. I just watched it on TV as everybody did it all over the United States, seeing how God's great hand was moving. You know, just as God's hand was moving through and by what we saw in that eclipse, we need to remind ourselves that God's hand is always moving in all of our lives and he covers us from all those things things that would possibly hurt us. Today, we need to know how much God loves us. Today, I want to invite you as we begin to talk about the love of God that God has for us. You know, the word of God tells us in 1 John, the third chapter, verse one, see how much our father loves us, that he calls us his children and that we really are his children. Let's pray. Gracious God, thank you for calling us your children. Thank you for adopting us into the family and treating us and giving us all that we need. Now we invite you to take control of our time together on today. Speak to us and speak through us and may we sense and feel your presence and your love. In Jesus name we pray, amen. I am just so fascinated with the great hand of God in all of our lives. And you know, God does wonderful and awesome things for us all. And you know, whenever God is doing something, you just can't help but stand back and be in awe. You know, as many of us saw in the heavens, how we saw the eclipse and it was so monumental. We're gonna talk about it for quite a period of time because we won't see this. Um, I probably won't see it again in my lifetime, but it gives us an opportunity to take a snapshot of how God does such unique and wonderful things. You know, today as we look into God's word, I want you to get a chance to see a unique and wonderful thing that God does. He displays his love for us, with us, in us, and through us. You know, coming off the heels of Resurrection Weekend, a time in which we call uh, commonly Easter, as the time in which you and I begin to see and recognize the great love that God has for us. And so today, I invite you to look with me at 1 John, the third chapter, verses one through seven from the New Living Translation of the Stated Text. It goes this way. See how very much our Father loves us, for he calls us his children, and that is what we really are. But the people who belong to this world don't recognize that we are God's children because they don't know him. Dear friends, we are already God's children, but he has not yet shown us what we will be like when Christ appears. But we do know that we will be like him for when we see him as he really is. And all who have this eager expectation will keep themselves pure just as he is pure. Everyone who sins is breaking God's law for all sin is contrary to the law of God. And you know that Jesus came to take away our sins and there is no sin in him. Anyone who continues to live in him will not sin, but anyone who keeps on sinning does not know him or understand who he is. Dear children, don't let anyone deceive you about this. When people do what is right, it shows that they are righteous even as Christ is righteous. God's inspired word to inspire us to do the work that he's called us to do. May we pray. Gracious God, our Father, we thank you again for your word that has been written and printed for our understanding and for our direction. We thank you how you inspired men and women and how they spoke what you gave to them that it might be beneficial to us in our contemporary day. So we pray and ask that the words of our mouths and the meditations of our heart will be acceptable in your sight. Thank you for being our strength and our redeemer. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I want to read again uh, that uh, uh, that clause of verse seven. He says, when people do what is right, 
it shows that they are righteous even as Christ is righteous. I've entitled this message, Do the Right Thing. Do the Right Thing. Many years ago, we find out uh, back in, in 1989, there was a gentleman by the name of Spike Lee. Many of you know Spike Lee. He's the one who always produces those movies and he always have those iconic shots uh, like nobody else did. Uh, Spike Lee, who, who went to Morehouse College, I remember when he was at Morehouse College, he was there at the same time that my older brother Leroy was there and I got a chance to see him. He was always known by everybody on campus because you know he has that notorious walk that you can see him any place. Well, Spike Lee wrote and produced this uh, play that is known as Do the Right Thing. And this play, Do the Right Thing, it was so amazing how it begins to give us all of those wonderful imageries and we see some of those great iconic personalities who are in it. You had Ozzie Davis, you had Ruby D, and the list goes on and on with all of those great actors and actresses who have won so many awards for their wonderful portrayals, not only in that production, but in so many more. It was amazing of all the imagery that you'll find within it. How he entitled it, Do the Right Thing. And the part that I used to love so much was that Ozzie Davis, who was known as the mayor, he was the one that anytime somebody did something, he would say, do the right thing. Even though he portrayed someone who was, quote unquote, the local uh, uh, person who was intoxicated, he always gave out some sage words to remind us to do the right thing. In this text today, we find these words to do what is right. This becomes a passage that calls all of us to struggle. Uh, this passage out of first John, the third chapter, you can see how it has some imagery um, and some of the same kind of words that you would hear in the gospel according to St. John, the third gospel. In so much so that this writer begins to talk to us a little bit about um, how we are the children of God. Now, it is important for us to clearly see what goes on in this passage, because just as all of us find ourselves, uh, we are all children and all of us have had a parent. All of us have had a father, fathers and mothers who may have been in our life in a very predominant way, some who may not have been there as much. But one of the things that we do know is that whenever you see a father in the life of a young boy or in a young girl, it teaches them something a little bit more. But we are so grateful that God gives us both fathers and mothers. The only reason I mention a father because we know that God is our heavenly father. And for using that as the metaphor, using that as the launching pad, I'm going to gear my message a little bit more of talking about a father and his relationship with his children. The text opens it up and says, see how very much our father loves us for he calls us his children. And that's who we really are. Well, this passage that we find out of first John begins to tell us about the love that God has for us, that he calls us his children. This talks about those of us who have come into the faith that God adopted us into the family. Now, you know, there's always interesting stories that people tell about people. Uh, it is amazing that many of us, you can tell who our family lineage comes from. You know, some, some folks say that you're the spitting image of your father. People might say, I see your dad in you. You remember Lion King, how Simba uh, looked into the water and he saw the reflection of his father, but he was really looking at himself. This text begins to remind us as God looks at us, as we look at the world, we should see the father within us. This text helps us to see how God reminds us how much he loves us. Now, whenever you begin to talk about the love of God and in the context of this text, you know, not getting into all the Greek that's involved in it, but it uses the Greek word for love, which is known as agape. That is that kind of love that is a God kind of love and that God loves us so deeply, more so than anybody else can. You know, basically in the Greek, we have some different expressions for love or different words that are used. In the English, we find out that our words are very limited because we say, I love my mom and dad, but we also say we love sports. We love apple pie. 
we love basketball. You know, I got to say something about last week and, and, and watching basketball. It was so amazing to see all of those NCAA championships and to see who won. And I don't know about you, but last uh, Sunday, I was just so excited to see the HBCU where they had all of these great players and these great coaches. And man, they had skills that you would normally see in the NBA, how people were hitting three point shots. That's another conversation. But it begins to remind us of how much God loves us. He loves us in a way that is so dynamic. He loves us in a way that is just so beyond our comprehension that we really cannot comprehend the love of God. But this text begins to remind us that God loves us and he calls us his real children. You, you know, in the natural, whenever someone biologically give birth to a child, you have this thing that is known as DNA. It's a scientific word, but it uses an acronym. Uh, it uses just the three letters DNA. That means that thing within us that makes us uniquely ourselves, it is transferred from us to our offspring and it creates a unique personality within them. You know, whenever we read this passage, we have to remind ourselves that God gives to us some spiritual DNA to cause us to be like him. The text opens up and it reminds us that see how very much our father loves us for he calls us his children. And that's who we really are. You know, God loved us so much that he reminds us that we belong to him and the world don't recognize us because we're so different. You know, we must remind ourselves in this contemporary age and every age that if the world did not love Jesus, what makes us think it's going to love us so much so? You know, when we are like God, when we are like our Father, when we are like our Savior and Lord Jesus the Christ, He did things that caused people to not so much love Him, but to find themselves being against Him. And you can't help but be against someone who's doing good if you are not of the same DNA. We find out here in this text, it begins to remind us there's some forces that are in our world. We have forces of good and forces of evil. The good comes from God and God alone. The evil comes from uh, that, uh, that spiritual force uh, that we call the devil. It comes from that spiritual force in the world that many of us have to give acknowledgement that it does exist. In our passage, it begins to helps us to understand that they don't recognize us because they don't recognize and know the father. It is important for us to know that when God created us, he put something in us that is like him. That is his spirit. You know, we find out we have got the Father, got the Son, and got the Holy Spirit. And when we accept Jesus Christ into our lives as our Lord and our Savior, it is then God dwells within us. He fills us with another portion of himself that is known as the Spirit. The Holy Spirit dwells within us, and he gives us the same characteristics, the traits, and the attributes of God. But we must remind ourselves when we begin to say that, we have to also remind ourselves we are still human beings that dwell in a body. Even though we are spirit, our spirit dwells in a body and we're constantly fighting this tug of war against doing what is right. It is much like that movie, Do the Right Thing. In that movie, Do the Right Thing, we find out there was a character in there who was known as Radio Rahim. He was the one who would carry a boom box on his shoulder and he would be playing the, the song uh, that was uh, written and produced by, by Public Enemy. Uh, that song that said, fight the power. It is important for us to know that in this passage, in order for us to do the right thing, we have to fight against the power, the powers of evil, the powers of darkness. And whenever you and I begin to think about it, it reminds us that the Bible tells us in the book of Ephesians how we are to put on the whole armor of God because we are fighting against the battle, because our spiritual battle and the weapons of this warfare are mighty through God. They are not flesh and blood, but they are those powerful instruments that God gives us 
to war in the heavenlies. That means we have to put on the whole armor of God. We have to have the word of God, the breastplate of righteousness, uh, the helmet of salvation. We have to have the shield of faith, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And our feet always covered with the preparation of the gospel of peace. The text lets us see that there's a battle we have to fight. It becomes very apparent to everyone who reads this text. Since we're now the children of God, that means there was a transformation in our lives. It means we've been changed. And whenever we have had a change, our nature changed. You know, before we knew God, uh, we find ourselves being uh, sinners who don't have a savior. But then when we get a relationship with God, we become sinners who have a savior who's put a spark of divinity in us. And it becomes our responsibility to fight against all of those powers of evil, the powers of wickedness that causes us not to listen and be obedient unto God. The text lets us see that there's a struggle that's going on. Just like we find out in that play, Do the Right Thing, you find out the struggles of classism, the struggles of racism, the struggles of people's voices being heard. It sounds just like the struggles we face in our contemporary world today. It's always important for us to know that you and I must read from the word of God that we know is truly the word of God. Not some book that somebody is trying to use to push their own agenda. That's the reason why we must make sure that we truly know what the authentic word of God is. We now live in a day and a time and an age whereby there are so many things that are happening. There are so many lying wonders. There are so many people who will call evil good and call good evil. And this text begins to remind us we are now fighting against a battle. And the battle that we fight is a spiritual battle. In the spiritual battle that we fight, we need to make sure that we know we have the right stuff on the inside. Whenever you and I have the Holy Spirit of God in our lives, it is then that we can authenticate that we are the children of God. And since we are the children of God, the text tell us to do the right things. That is that if we are truly the children of God, the power of Christ that raised him up from the dead dwells in us and it will cause a transformation in us. Now we need to remind ourselves that we are still mortal human beings. And whenever we read this text, one thing that we have to always remember is that when the New Testament scriptures were written, it didn't have all the punctuation. It didn't have all of the many different ways in which we use to read things. It was just written. And as it was written, it did not have commas, it did not have periods. It was written in Greek. Uh, before that, it was written in Hebrew. And you had to know when to stop and start because originally it wasn't written in chapter and verse. But that took place so you and I could find specific spots in scripture that will remind us of the things that we need to know so you can readily identify it. So this book that we know is First John, the third chapter, verses one through seven. It wasn't originally written that way, but it was broken up in such a way that we would know this is the first little epistle of John. It is the third division. It is the third chapter to help us to begin to see these very specific places that God helps us through insights that come through and by his spirit and the one who was inspired to write it. So now we see that we are the children of God and it does not yet appear what we shall be. Now, it, none of us fully know what God is going to do in us, with us and through us. We just have to trust him. And it doesn't appear what we shall be. But when we see him in glory, we shall be like him. We shall be the full manifestation of spirit without any flesh because, you know, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. But until that time comes, you and I have to do the right thing. The passage tells us that we have to do the right thing by living a life that is acceptable unto God. Now, one of the things that we have to remind ourselves is that he begins to delve with something within the context of the text. He says that if we truly are the children of God, we have the DNA. We have that thing on the inside to cause us to want to do the will of God. But we also have to wrestle with the struggles and the temptations of sin. 
And he says within this passage that if you and I truly love God, we won't sin. That means we won't have certain habitual sins that we keep doing over and over again because God has delivered us from the power and the bondage of sin and has liberated us and given us new life that comes through and by Christ Jesus, our Lord. And therefore, we find out that the powers of darkness and of evil cannot have dominion over us. That means we have to do the right thing. We have to understand that God wants to put a spirit in us so that we can do what God has called us to do by us listening and becoming obedient and yielding to his voice. You know, the greatest challenge that all of us face is yielding to the voice of God and the will of God. Because we live in this and occupy this body that's made out of human flesh that wants to do its own thing. You know, when you're hungry, your stomach will tell you it'll start making a whole lot of noise. It'll start growling. And if you ever try to suppress that appetite, it gets louder and louder. And everybody says, you must be hungry. Well, we must remind ourselves that we have to keep our flesh under control. You know, whenever we talk about our flesh under control, it's not just certain things, but it's all those things that we do that keeps us from doing the will of God, of serving God. And this text, it begins to remind us that if we have the power of God within us, that means that we decide that we want to serve God with all that we have. Now, we also find earlier written, it says that if anyone says they're without sin, they are a liar. All of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. God reminds us of that. All of us know that. But we get to a point in our lives that we say, Lord, I want to do the right thing. I want to treat everybody right. I want to love everybody. I want to forgive everybody just as I have been forgiven. You know, the text begins to remind us of some great principles that we find out and attributes that we find in God. God is a forgiving and a loving God. You and I have to be forgiving and loving individuals if we say that we are the children of God. That means we don't hold grudges. We don't remind people always of everything that they've done. You and I have to do a daily purging. We have to ask ourselves every day, like the old song says, search me, Lord. If you find anything that shouldn't be, take it out and strengthen me. I want to be right. I want to be saved. I want to be whole. Search me, Lord. You know, it's amazing how when you and I sit at our computers or when we're talking to our computers or our smartphones, we can give it a command and it will follow. You know, we can tell it search for certain files and it'll find them almost in a split second. We must ask God, God, search me. If there's any way in me that is not like you, change me. You know, I love that song, change me, oh God. God, I want you to make me brand new because I want to be more and more like you. It's important for us as we read this text to do the right thing. The right thing is to be yielded to Almighty God. The right thing is to say, Lord, let your will be done, not mine. The right thing is that we must remind ourselves that God wants us to live a lifestyle, to have a way of living and serving God that brings him glory and that we give him all the praise and we take no credit for ourselves. This text reminds all of us that we got to struggle. You know, whenever you think about that movie, Do the Right Thing, you know, he, he had this ring that was on that talked about how you got to fight the power. You and I have to fight against the powers of evil, fight against the powers of darkness. And the only way we can fight is with our weapons of our warfare, which are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds and casting down every vain imagination that exalts itself against the word of God. We got to do the right thing. We got to trust God and let let him lead us and guide us that we would not only make it into heaven, but we'll share the good news of the gospel with someone else. Do the right thing. We have to do the right thing by telling the people in our home and sharing with them God's love in a very personal way for them to know there's been a transformation in us and God can do the same for them. We have to do the right thing. We have to make sure that in our community, in our world, we let everybody see the true forgiveness of God in our lives manifested by us for giving one another and giving each other another chance. It is important for us to know that this text is written for all of us to help all of us fight against the battle and the struggle against sin and Satan. You see, in an Old Testament concept, we didn't have uh, the devil that was personified, but you talked about those powers of evil. 
In our contemporary society, we must remind ourselves that the devil is not an individual, but it's a power. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in high places. It's a force. And it's a force that you and I have to fight against. It's a force that we have to say, no, devil, I'm going to say no to you and yes to God. I'm going to do the right thing. God, when I have the opportunity to show somebody the love that you've given to me, I'm going to do the right thing. I'm going to do the right thing by telling everyone about the goodness of the saving power that's in Jesus Christ. I'm going to do the right thing. I'm going to do the right thing by helping those people, not only where I live, but even foreign and abroad so that I can share the love of God. I want to do the right thing. I want to make sure that I get out and vote and make sure that I do what I'm supposed to do as a citizen. I want to do the right thing. I want to do the right thing by being a good citizen in this world. I want to do the right thing by being an example, not only to men, not only to women, but boys and girls. I want to do the right thing by being a good husband, being a good father, being a good sibling. I want to do the right thing because the right thing is what God calls us all to do. Today, I want to challenge you as I challenge myself. Let's do the right thing. Whenever it's that temptation to say, I'm going to just speed up five more miles, do the right thing, because the faster you go, the greater the incident of a dangerous accident can occur. Let's do the right thing. But, you know, the right thing for all of us to do is to say, Father, forgive me of my sins. Come into my life and save me today. I want to challenge you to do the right thing, to surrender to the power of almighty God and to allow Jesus to be the Lord of your life and to be the savior of your soul. And then if you do that, let us know. You know, the Bible tells us if we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in our heart that God is raising from the dead, we shall be saved. And then we want to celebrate that salvation with you. Email us at join at the fountain of Raleigh.org to say that, hey, Pastor Anderson, the fountain, I have joined that group of believers, the people who trust you, who love you and serve you. And we want to help you grow and we want to teach you scripture and we want to share the scriptures with you. And so we invite you that if, if you will so desire, you can become a part of our fellowship. It doesn't matter where you are geographically because God's hand is not short. God reaches us wherever we are. And we, through this virtual world in which we live, we can reach each other no matter where we are. And then if you've done that and you want us to pray for a situation or circumstance in your life or someone else, email us at prayer at the fountain of Raleigh.org. We want to pray with you and pray for you that you and I together will know that as we talk to God, God talks back to us. And we love to celebrate with you all the goodness of the Lord. And we invite you. Uh, to come on and celebrate with us this morning. If you're listening to this early at 7 a.m. when it first drops or maybe a little bit later, join us at 9 o'clock a.m. in person here at the Fountain of Raleigh because it is where God's blessings never stop flowing because God has a great blessing in store for you and we want to make sure that we share it with you. I want to pray with you and pray for you as our time comes to a close. Let's pray together. Gracious Father, we thank you for reminding us the importance of doing the right thing, trusting you as Lord and Savior, winning the battle over sin, Satan, and self. And Father, help us to teach men and women, boys and girls, the importance of knowing you and serving you and loving you and doing what is right. We thank you that your word and your scriptures that tell us he has showed you what is right, but to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. So, God, we ask that you teach us and help us to do the right thing, that this world and other lives might be changed. And we'll be so careful to say thank you. Father, I pray your benediction blessings will be with all my brothers and sisters. Now unto him, the great shepherd who gave his life for the sheep. May the Lord bless, preserve and keep you from the rising of the sun to the going down of the same. May he bless you in your leisure, your labor, your joys and your sorrows and give you bright hope for today and tomorrow. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen, and amen. Take the Lord with you everywhere you go, and we'll look forward to seeing you here at the fountain. To sow a seed to the Fountain of Raleigh Fellowship, visit our newly redesigned website, thefountainofraleigh.org, and select Sow a Seed from the homepage. 
Also, giving has been made easier with the new Fountain of Raleigh app, available now in the Apple App Store and Google Play Store. Download today, select giving from the main menu, and then follow the directions to complete your giving through Subsplash. Thank you so very much for all of your gifts and donations that you've given to the Fountain of Raleigh Fellowship. We thank you for what you've done in the past, what you're currently doing, and what you will do in the future. Your gifts and donations helps us to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ, not only locally, but throughout the world. Thank you again for your gifts, and may God continue to richly bless you. It is here at the Fountain that we believe that we are exceedingly and abundantly blessed, and may you receive those blessings that God has in store for you.